I'd like to uh, welcome. Would you? I'd like to welcome you to this interview. Would you like to introduce yourself and state your rank for the record, please? My name is Wayne Scott. I was in the Navy five years. I got a rank with both mate first class when I was discharged. I was in I was in uh, the armed guard for four years and something, and then went back to the Pacific and went into the fleet back into the fleet and uh, under the fleet air, in fleet air wing one. I drove Admiral Bolger then for a year. I come out. Okay. Um. Do you mind if I ask you how you got into the service? Um, I volunteered. Volunteered? We had Pearl Harbor and I volunteered. Um, how did you hear about Pearl Harbor? Did you? Well, everybody heard about it, man. We had, oh, we had our ships, our Navy sunk, and yeah, everybody it? heard about it. It was that's something that you can't un understand if you don't. I, just, I'm I never even knew where Pearl Harbor was. Never heard of it until that. I'd been out in the field all day cutting beans down below zero. Well, well, and we went in on December the 7th. And I went in and said, boy, we're going to have trouble. Japan attacked Pearl Harbor. I didn't know where Pearl Harbor was. But uh, soon I found out where it was, Northern Fleet and all. And one of the kids was on the Lexington. He, they, he, they flew him home, and uh, he talked me into joining the Navy. I was going to join tank division. I would have been with Patton if I had joined tank division, but it didn't. I went in the, in the Navy then. Um, so, um, where were you born and raised? Well, what? Where, where were you born and raised? I was born in Root House, Illinois. May the 30th, 1921. Was your, was your family background, you said you were My cutting. mother was a nurse. My father was a railroad engineer. And did you say you were farming at the time before you joined but the service? I, uh, no, I worked on a farm before I went into service. Um, were you in a relationship at any, or at any time during the service or before? Or no, that was my, I had five bro five of us boys. Was all in there in World War Two. See, from the Air Force, Army, and Navy. Um, sorry. Do you mind if I ask you more about that that Purple Heart you were talking about earlier, and how you ended up not? It. Well, we, we was uh, in invasion of Italy. We was in 51 air raids. And we, we, we shot down planes all for seven days. And the Navy said we shot down two. Said we can't give you any credit for it. And the Army, the Lieutenant come aboard and said, I want to thank you, boy. You ought to see what been, uh, is going on over there. Any place you look, there's a German plane. He said there's nothing but planes every place. And said it hadn't been for you boys, they would got us because we don't have the anti aircraft guns like you boys have got. And we shot I, we fought them in, for seven days. And they finally quit coming. But we left that after seven days and invaded a bit like Snarl. Um but there was, we were talking about that, how you had said you had dove into the water, or how someone well, that was after the water. Uh, after the war. I went back into the Pacific, and I went into the fleet, and I went aboard the Bering Strait, and uh, we was going to dock one, or to quarters one morning, and the army boat blowed up. And that's one thing that I had got stopped real quick because uh, the boats of mate, Mr. Mate got them and inspecting boats, tore all the hash of the, the boards up in, uh, and uh, to the bills, cleaned them out, painted them, and got the gas and oil out of them. He had overfilled the gas tank and ran down in there and exploded and burnt that rearming boat up and caught him on fire. 
and he jumped out. Of, he was knocked out for a while, and I was standing right by the rail. We was going to quarters when it happened, and I seen him, and he jumped in the water. He had nothing but a ball of fire, and I dove in after him and got him and helped him around to the gangway. Okay. Um, what kind of training were you involved in and given by the? Well, anyway, I went to Great Lakes for boot camp, and we was only in there uh, four weeks. Then I went to uh, the pier in Chicago, and uh, went to a gunnery school for about a month. And I shipped to New Orleans and shipped out then on a merchant ship. So. You were stationed on a merchant ship for I was stationed in the, uh, the armed guard base armed guard in New base. Orleans, yes. There was a lot of men there, thousands. You can see that's, a, that's a, also a, a boat dock, I mean a ship building there too, yeah. shipyards and all. And we went in and got it right out of there brand new. Took her, took her to sea. Um, can you tell me about these these ship convoys you have written here, 70 to 80 ships? Yeah, they, we'd pull out of the harbor and they'd make up ships, and, and uh, you never knew exactly how many ships was in there. But you could look almost 10 miles in any direction and there's number wow. of ships, destroyers. And one day then, long in June, we, we was going our way then to go to get ready to go into Sicily, I guess. And we went to, to Oran, North Africa. And well, here come a Navy plane of flying over. We was out in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, and I went, where in the world did that Navy plane come from? Out here in the middle of the Atlantic. And pretty soon here come a couple of cruisers, and then a flat, a baby flat top. And I was in an English ba a, a battle wagon. He was with them too. And uh, then they sunk, I think, 26 Japanese subs. I mean, German subs. Um, can you tell me about some of these battles or campaigns you were involved in, like Casablanca in North Africa? And is there. Well, you we, we, uh, we wasn't. Uh, the kind of battles we was in is air battles, fighting planes. We wasn't ashore, but then I finally went ashore in Antwerp, Belgium. I was on shore patrol. But we worked with the Army all the time, because we had the soldiers on there all the time whenever we went into an invasion. But our battles was just with planes. Uh, let me ask one question. Did you ever uh, fire anti anti aircraft artillery? Or yeah. You, yeah, that was one of your jobs. You did that. Yeah. What? Well, what? How big were the guns? The seventy-five millimeter 75. was uh, uh, that's a surface and uh, ground and air, mm -hmm. and then twenty millimeters. But our we also had a five inch fifty one, the heavy gauge uh, gun. Mm -hmm. But that was on the first ship I was on. But the last ship I was on, we had a 5 inch 38, and it was like on the destroyers. We come in to, to uh, I, Norfolk, I don't remember now where they put it on at, but Norfolk are in New York. And But I believe Norfolk where we load up the 135th Division, Tank Division. But they put it on, and we went uh, into. No, we didn't either. We, uh, we uh, they put that on, and then we went into France. We we had soldiers went into Southampton, filled up with soldiers, and then went into France. And we went from June to Christmas Day, hitting that beach, about every three days, back to Southampton, load up. Back to, finally got to there was nothing left in England. I think there was five merchant ships 
an armed guard cruise that was that took all that stuff over there, finally. And uh, we, it's, it's, we just finally then on Christmas Day, we took a leave and uh, went to south uh, to uh, Ireland, north, and uh, we was up there supposed to have a 48-hour leave. Left a half the crew to home, and the next, my time to go home, walked into the USO, told us to all report back to our ship. And we didn't go. We stayed. We were on Liberty, and we stayed. And the ship waited we got back. <laughs> and uh, How long did they have to wait? 48 hours. <laughs> and I got back, all oh, the officers was mad. Where you been? I said, having a good time. <laughs> and we, uh, so that, uh, then we went to, back to England, Southampton, loaded on troops, went up the Seine River in France, up to uh, the Seine River to, uh, well, I'm trying to think of the Chinese name, of the French name now. I knew I'd have trouble when we both started taking the, I can't think of the name of the town now, but, but we took troops to Patton, there, on the same river. I can't, I know the name of the town, but I can't think of it. I can't remember nothing no more. Yeah, you're doing pretty good, though. You, and you are. Um, so, what was your specialty when you were in the service? Um, well, uh, we were gunners. We were gunners. So now everybody was a gunner that was in that. But then I was uh, a, a boat's mate. I was in charge of gun crew. Uh -huh. um, so how did you feel about being in the service and being in the war and the war itself? Uh, it didn't bother me a bit. I volunteered to get in there and I stayed till it was over. Bother me a bit, and and you got to let the Germans come at you. Well, you you get where you don't care when you kill them. How did uh, how did most of the men and women feel at that time? Most most people wanted to. We didn't have no trouble when we were shooting down planes. We were shooting down fast to come in. We didn't care. It didn't bother us. The, and you know, once a bomber come over one night. German bomber, and he wasn't about 60 feet in the air like we heard him coming. And I j jumped in the gun tub and strapped myself to a 20 millimeter, I threw the uh, magazine on first, loaded it and got ready. I see him a coming. He went over, his bomb bay was open, come right over the gun tub, and I looked right up at him. I could see the lights from their instruments and I could see the bomber deer setting up there and the, the bombs in there. And it went right on over and I started to shoot. And the gunner's mate said, don't shoot, Scott, don't shoot. And so I let him go on by. And I said, why didn't you want me to shoot? He said, because you would have blowed that chain right up on top of us. But I was having 20 millimeter exploding up there. Would have blowed them damn bombs up. And the wheel would have been blown up. Ah. So the plane went on over, and pretty soon we heard the motor rev up, and he took off. And then we heard boom, 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 three bombs they dropped. And boy, then their lights come on on the shore. And as we see them going up in the air, you know, and coming around. And here come the P-38. And we can see the tracers going into that plane. And there's just one big explosion, complete fire. And I, they never got out of the plane. They just burned up in it. That P-38 sure took care of them real quick. That was a great plane, P-38. It was a German bomber. But that would have happened, and that gunner's mate said to me, after we seen that plane blow up, you know, he said, now that would have happened to us if you had shot into that gas tank. But it, we'd have been blown, right, burned up right here, and he was right. That thing went 60 feet above me, and I, boy, I couldn't miss that 20 moment. You could have, you could have died in that. I would have blowed up, yeah. yeah. I would have been a 
a nut. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you mind if I ask you if you had any friends during your service that that stick out in particular? Yes, I had one friend. I had a lot of friends. Yes, uh, and I got one uh, down in Birmingham, Alabama. We were on the ships together, and some of them I was on three ships together with them for. But their time to come in, the gun crew stroke broke up. I know, but then when we went in, the, I was on the, uh, the, uh, the Mitchell Palmer, I believe it was, when we went into Antwerp, and we took uh, Sherman tanks in. And uh, then I went on shore patrol. And while I was on shore patrol, I met a man by the name of Frank Gleason. He had been in the Olympics and was over there in the Olympics when Hitler took all the medals away from him. You remember? Ah, Jesse yeah. Owens and all Jesse Owens was that. And he stayed over there and, and he married one of the Belgian girls and he went in business. And he uh -huh. had a tavern there. And uh, he was telling me about when he was in there. He went in there, he weighed about 200, I guess, and 75 pounds, maybe 280. He was over six foot tall, and he was a fighter. He was a he was a man, uh -huh. but when they got done with him, he only weighed probably about a, about two ten, maybe two, maybe one hundred and eighty. Uh -huh. really, he was really poor down. And, and he told me that they took him out of the firing squad six times, and he said the la and he said the first time. He said, I was standing there, and I, the woman had put the mask on his face. No. He said, no, I'll look at you bastards right in the eyes. And he said, yeah, they put the guns up, and he said, I don't know what. And they fall, pulled the trigger, and he said, I never felt nothing. I couldn't figure out what it was, and they used blanks. And then they started laughing. Uh, just to scare them? Yeah, I just thought that, well, he, they did scare him all right. <laughs> he said he couldn't understand why he couldn't feel the bullets. But then he said, finally, they took him uh, three other times. But he said, the last time they took him, they intend to kill him. He said that they had him in there and they was beating on him. And he hit the, the commandant, knocked him over the, his desk and back in the corner. He said, man, they beat on him with everything. And drug him out there and put him, uh, got ready to shoot him. I had the guns up and started to pull, about ready to pull the trigger. He said it was a hell of a noise. And he said the Germans started running. And he said he seen the, all the gates and everything going down, and then come American tank and GI's behind it. Is it? Oh. Yeah, he said, boy, wow. I never so glad to see GI's my life. And then they got him free, and he come back home. What a story that is. Yeah, and he was in the Olympics, see. And I tried to get a man, a, a, t a man that was on the a, a, a sports announcer in Pittsburgh to uh, write us a check up on him, you know, because he was still alive then. Try to check up on him, because he was in the underground. You know, he blew up tanks and everything else. And uh, I tried to uh, get that, and he never even answered my letter. Never done nothing. But uh, when, what the one thing that they helped get guys back across the channel, you know, and they also saved the docks. The Germans had the docks all, it was, a, it was, it was the most modern seaport in the world at that time. It was all electric. And the Germans wanted to blow it up. And they had them charges all over the place and had it hooked up electrically, you know, to blow up if they had to go. And, and they never bothered to, to charge us nothing. They just cut the wires loose and so that they wouldn't see them. Mm. And they never tore up nothing. And when they tried to blow it up, when they evacuated, but it wouldn't, they saved the dock, but they didn't blow up. Wow. They kept it. But he was in the White Brigade, and they captured him because of the, there was a hotel right next to his business. And... Uh, this guy's son got to run around the Germans and get favors, you know, get food. And he turned them in, turned the underground in, 
the White Brigade, that's the name of the underground. And they blew up tanks and everything else. They killed a lot of Germans. And he was down in his basement where they had the radio. And they were talking in England, to England. And they they knew he was there because this kid had squealed on him. And they went in and caught him when they caught the whole bunch. I don't know how many they got that night. But uh, they sold him in prison. And I don't know. Story. Yeah. Can I ask you about meeting General Patton? Was it? Oh, yeah. Yes. Can I? Would you mind telling that story about how you met him? Met who? General Patton. Oh well, we met General Patton. Uh, we was uh, in Oran getting ready to go in the invasion of Sicily, and he come aboard the ship. Me and as a sergeant was standing guard. We had the army on there, tank crews. And uh, we picked them up, I guess. Uh, they were the ones we picked up in the... Uh, no, it was, uh, the, the one, the tank crew we had was in Italy. We, we loaded uh, part of the 7th Army on in North Africa, in, Sola and in the North Africa, and it was patent, had the 7th Army in Sicily. And he come aboard, and then he stopped. I was talking to us, you know, when he got ready to leave. And, he asked me, he said, Sailor, what in the world is a sailor doing on a merchant ship? And I said, well, we're in charge of the guns on here. We're the gun crew. He said, well, we won't have to worry no more, will we? I said, I hope not. <laughs> but that is, and then we talked to him, he talked to us a while, shook our hands and he left. And I always liked uh -huh. that. And I always thought he was a fine man I was around him in North Africa. And he, he changed the fight in Port North Africa when he took over North Africa. Right. He yep. started winning, not losing. Yep. So he was a fighting man. Did he ever say anything And he about prayed the, every night. Did he ever talk about Monty? About what? Monty, you know, the, the, the uh, French, or the, the, Eng the English. Oh, the, you mean English, Montgomery? Montgomery. Oh yeah, he was he was trying to beat Montgomery at everything he could beat him at, and he did. There's always that battle between those. Yeah, two and guys. he did beat Montgomery. You know, he went into one town there in Sicily and waiting on Montgomery to get there. You know. Right. <laughs> yeah, he he was a good officer. A lot of stories about the battles those two guys had with each oh, other. Oh yeah. Well, you know, they put him before the head of the Third Army. Mm -hmm. That's where it was formed in France, on uh, on uh, well, let me tell you, the, the, well, when in Salerno, not uh, uh, but was uh, we had two beach heads, one of them was Angio, and one was uh, Salerno, I believe it was. I think that sounds well, right. It was Angio, I believe it was, and uh, but he went. I don't know which one, he. That's what because the other one. Was it was a big cliff, you know, that yeah. the soldiers had to go up. The Omaha, uh, Omaha Beach was that the in Omaha? Was that the Omaha one that had beach, the yeah. big uh, cliff? That's the whole beach, you know. That's the yeah. whole thing, Omaha. And uh, he, they formed the Third Army back in there. You know, we took tanks. I don't know how many tanks we took from England in there. We didn't know what you know. We just took tanks, mm -hmm. and the crews, you know. And uh, when all at once I uh, heard boy Patton was taking a whole breast for Denson one day. <laughs> and he was gone. <laughs> uh, what else you got? Um, you said your son was in Korea. Um, you mind talking about how it felt being the father of a soldier as well? No, what? You said your son was in Korea. Do you mind if, uh, talking about how it felt being a father of a soldier as well as being... I wouldn't know soldier. about they were. See, I wouldn't know if there were my son was over there. That's a war. Um, yes, I was just wondering if you could talk about what it was like being a father at, at oh, the time. Oh, yeah, I of, worried of about him. And I got him a credit ticket, uh, a, a telephone credit card, so he could call home, you know. That way he didn't have to have money. Yeah. And he could call any time he wanted to, you know. Yeah, I'd give him a credit card. 
and we worried about him all the time he was over there, but then I had my one of my son-in-laws was, I had one son-in-law was in Korea, and the other son-in-law was in Vietnam. So I mean, we've pretty well been associated with the Lord. And my, my son-in-laws are both dead now. Did they die in the in service? No, or? they died after they got home. Oh. But the one that was in Vietnam, he was sick most of the time. And he got back. Was that related to the Vietnam experience? I don't know. I, I know he was sick. You know, I don't know what happened. To, we never did ever talk about Vietnam or anything other about it, you know. I just, I, I'm, uh, you had the first dinner to help get Vietnam veterans jobs. President Nixon sent three men from Washington, and uh, I was commander of the VFW in Root House. And the governor in Springfield sent three men, and uh, they were out to help, and the uh, general and uh, Congressman Paul Finley came. And uh, one of the guys said, uh, I'd like to tell you something, Congressman. He said, I tried to get a job, and I, I've had 1,700 hours in the air in, with helicopters in Korea, or Vietnam, I mean. And he said, when I come home, I try to get a state job in a helicopter, and they told me I was a quarter inch too short after 1,700 hours. And, and Senator Sandy said, I told him, said, you wait, you, I want to talk to you when this meeting's over. And he got him a job, and he flew astronauts down in Texas. Yeah. <laughs> he got him a job right away there. Right well, a quarter, quarter of an inch didn't seem to matter for 1,700 hours, did it? No, it, it didn't it, make no difference how good a helicopter how, how it, how it he was. How would a quarter inch but, make any difference after that? You know, in a helicopter, yeah. <laughs> but they said I was the first one in the whole nation to get, to look, to get jobs for Vietnam veterans. Is that right? Yeah. We had 50, got 50 Vietnam veterans belong to the post a little while. <laughs> That's a lot for one post. Yeah. Oh. What else you have? Well, uh, why don't you go down to um, this this section here? Yeah, let's open up some of the okay. get some opinions. Um, how did your lifestyle and your life change when you joined the service when you started working for the military? Well, I was young. And uh, nothing ever bothered me. If when I changed, I changed. It didn't bother me. It never bothered me. I was in the CC camp, see. Almost everybody in World War II was in the CC camp. We were kids. Mm -hmm. Now that was a government job, you know. We lived like the Army. We had Army clothes, but we went to the field and worked. We would cut down trees, built fences, made fence posts, built dams, built lakes. And everything like that. Now you called it CC camp. Yeah, I'm soil not... conservation. Camp. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Like that? Then that's why it didn't bother me. Oh, yes. Oh, okay. So to change it into the army, it didn't bother me to, because I'd already barracks, been in the barracks, lived in barracks for years, you're, you're for eighteen accustomed. months in the CC camp. And used to working with the guys, you know, and so it never, never bothered me. And I was there for one purpose, anyhow. Do what I was told, and to kill as many Germans or Japs I could kill. That's what I was there for. And I did. I have a question for you. Can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. When you look at the news now and you see the way it's the way war is handled now, and the way uh, this country views going to serve. What's your opinion? What do you, what do you get out of it now? Things are a little different. We're a now. disgrace. 
Well, you want to, can you explain how that how you feel about that? How does it? I figure that we're a disgrace. How did this happen? We've got the best fighting men in the world and the best equipment, and the politicians stick them over there and let them get killed, and the politicians trying to fight the war in Washington. If they want to fight the war, they can go to war over there. That's where they ought to be, mm. not in here filling their pockets, and that's what they're doing. Every one of them filling their pockets of that war with kickbacks. Is it? It seemed different now than it was during the World War Two. Oh yeah, World War Two. How, everybody was, but how were you know? There's another thing that made me mad. We come back after the war, and Johnson was a fight in the Vietnam War. And he took half my Social Security. He took this half the Social Security of everybody that built tanks, guns, ammunition, and everything else, and stole their Social Security, and took it to, to bring uh, dope into this country from Vietnam. Patton, uh, Johnson was no good, as far as I'm concerned. You know, he gave a, a colored man his shoes when he's running for president, you know. Yeah, he said it gives him a hard man, the man on the farm, a pair of shoes. As soon as Johnson got on, he turned it on and showed it to him. A hole that big around in the sole. Yeah. Thanks. Johnson, they asked Johnson, well, look at that. What, what about that sole? How come you didn't have it fixed? Well, he can put cardboard in it. <laughs> yeah, now that's the kind of president Johnson was. Yes, a, lot sir. Of, a lot of people had the same view that you're saying. And the same way as Ronald Reagan. He took all of, our, all of our timber out of Oregon and Washington, loaded offshore, and then I was, and I'll bet you that this picture ain't on television no more, but there was him and, and Kickback Nancy was on the television, and this Jack would come up and give him a check for three million dollars. And you ought to see them waving their arms and jumping backwards. But they took it. They took the three million dollars, yes, sir, for that, uh, that I mean, all them lumber. And I'll bet you that that picture ain't on television no more. But there's a few people saw it. I saw it. Amazing how money. Huh? How it's amazing how money plays into the whole well, yeah. political. Yeah. Game. yeah. They didn't send the money back. They kept it. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Have you, you've got something you've been thinking about. No, uh, I, I didn't talk about Frank Leeson. That's the only about it. He's the only one that. Uh, well, I knew a lot of people over there in a different place, you know. I read a lot of their house. One time, I went down to the supply officer on the ship. We was in Southampton. I asked him, I said, could I have the meat that I'm, I'd be eating for dinner and supper? I said, I've been invited to this family's house, and they want me to eat dinner with them and supper. And I said, you know, they'll probably use the only meat they'll have for the next six months. And he mm -hmm. said, come on and go with me. We went down into the cold storage. He gave me a big uh, thing about that big around. Must have been 15 pound of roast. And I went out the gate and the cop was standing there and he said, I told him, I said, I ain't taking this to sell it. I'm taking it to a guy that I'm going to eat supper and dinner with. He said, boy, I wish I could go with you to dinner. And one other time, the cook sold a, a bone out to a dog we had. And that guy started to take that bone away from that dog. And I, I reached down and took the bone and took the dog inside. And I told the cook, I said, I told him what happened. And he said, I'll never put anything out to that dog again. I said, I never thought anything about it. That guy told me, said, there's more meat on that bone than I've had in the last month. And I said, man. You're reminding me of something. My mom and dad, uh, my dad served in Midway in World War II, and they told me the stories about uh, stamps, you know, for coffee and sugar and, mm -hmm. and gum and, 
and uh, rationing stamps, or is that what they were called? Something like that. Yeah. And everybody got to, and and my grandfather was a baker, and he used to during that during the depression used to barter. They would trade. He would change a pie for the butcher to give him some meat. Yeah. Now, do you remember? Do you remember what that was like? Yeah, I came home on leave, and I went down to the leave uh, to the leave officer in Carrollton. I told him I'm going to be home for 30 days. I'd like to get uh, some meat stamps and sugar. And they give me stamps, and I give give it to my mother so she could buy meat. They give me more than what I would have had if it had, you know if I'd have been there, but. They give me a pretty good ration stamp. Things a little different now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I tell you, we we are de uh, our politicians are destroying America. A lot of people would agree with that. What you're saying. But I think they this is the greatest country in the world, and if they don't believe it, let them go over there and get in that war for about a week. They only had to be there one day, and, and they'll go back to Washington and be thankful that they're all congressmen and senators, I'll guarantee you. Yeah. And they wouldn't want to start no more wars either. That sounds like really good advice. Send, send all the politicians to I war. think that might be just the, the way. We'll send them this interview so they can hear that. And, you know, get them to... I, think, I think they'll appreciate it. Um, so I'd kind of like to expand on that a little bit more. The, the way it sounds when you're saying that um, you don't think maybe war is always the best option, but... I, World War II, we had no choice. Wor World War II, we were attacked. Yes, um, we had to fight. Yep. But the, uh, the others have been for oil. Uh, look, uh, look at the, the money. The Bush wasted. He built up a and, and Storm and Arnold, Arnold had uh, he had the tank crew ready to go. He'd already won one battle, but the, the millions of dollars they sent hauling them tanks over there, getting that army built up over there, and then stopped it all. As soon as he got all the oil he wanted, he stopped the whole damn thing, and we messed around over there and got soldiers killed for two years before they done anything. He didn't do nothing. He summoned in there and got him killed too. Anything to get oil, that's all the bushes was after. That's why it seems like money is such a big part of the game. You know, money and power. And when it comes to war and loss of life or appreciation of life, or even somebody else's country, you know, when, when uh, when one country goes invades in an, into another country, a lot of questions have to be asked. Yeah. Because we're talking about losing life and treasure, and that's why we want. That's why we wanted this interview with you. Because when we do these interviews, we get the real thing. You know, you've been there and you've done that, and you've been able to express all. Of it. You know, the thing that I, uh, made me kind of wonder in, in England, everything was crashing. When we went in and have went into a restaurant, and I said, I'll take steak and mashed potatoes and gravy. You know, the steak was uh, salami, uh, salam, uh, what is that? Uh, salami? Salami, yeah, well, or, and uh, I said, well, I'll Pre down. Pressed, what they call yeah. pressed meat? Yeah. So uh, <laughs> then when we went to Ireland, up to Belfast, to take a vacation, Got all the whiskey, all the ice cream, all the steaks we wanted. <laughs> and I said, man, they're under England. How in the world England would allow us? They ought to come up here and get these steaks and take them back down to England. <laughs> wow. Well, we want to thank you for doing this interview. No, thank you. Well, I, I, I don't talk much about anything except... Just the people, you know. I like the people. Well, I've got to ask you one favor. You need to give me. I've got to give this guy a grade for this interview, and in a scale of A, B, and C, or D or F, 
give me an idea where you think I should give this guy for an interview. Well, you ought to get about a, an A or an uh, A plus. A or an A plus? That's yeah. a pretty high mark there. What do you have to say about that? <laughs> I'm not sure if I should be modest or not, but <laughs> I 